Great, welcome everybody. Um, this is to uh, Meckler's Spotlight on Soft Skills with Hard Impacts. Uh, my name's Hayley Jarrick. I'm going to be co-presenting um, uh, this workshop uh, with a good friend of mine, Sarah Blake. So she'll be on screen and you can see her as well. Um, and we're going to be running through um, just a few things on really working on the soft skills we need to be change agents within the environmental space um, and getting getting all of those uh, working on ourselves rather than on the what's and the problems of things as they're working through. So um, thank you for joining me today. Um, look forward to spending the next 90 minutes with you. Um, as always, I would like to begin um, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of land on which we joined from and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, from wherever you are joining from around Australia. Um, uh, please just uh, I acknowledge that um, the land that we're all living and breathing on is sort of fueling our everyday. So thank you um, very much for joining us on there as well. Also, we're going to be having a bit of fun. Um, so I know that sometimes when working on your soft skills, it can be a bit daunting. So just to make things a little bit interesting, <laughs> uh, we've created a playlist for this session. So the playlist is called Soft Skills, Hard Impacts, Meckler, if you look for it on Spotify. Um, we put a few songs in there to get us started, but please jump in the chat um, and add any of the songs that pop into your head as we go through any of the subject matter um, for the workshop today. Um, I'll add all of those songs back into the playlist and then share the link to the playlist afterwards as well. But please feel free, you can jump in and find it right now and have a look to see what's already there. Um, and open up that chat and just whack in some songs that you think we should be adding in there. Either direct message me if you're a bit embarrassed um, or put them in there for everyone to see. I'm happy to, to sort of play along where all of those are in there. Okay, so let's get down to the, the, the deep and dirty of it, of what we're going to be doing today. So the outcomes for this session or the learning objectives that we're hoping to achieve are sort of threefold. Firstly, we're going to learn what it takes to be a constructive conflict resolver. Um, and then we're going to go through and see what effective climate change impact remediation looks like. And that's sort of like an action, not like a theory. So we're um, sort of really working through that. And then we're going to run you through a hypothetical. Um, so rather than a case study, which might sort of um, bend things in either way. We've got a really cool hypothetical that we're going to work through and sort of put some of those soft skills to the test. Throughout the workshop today, we are going to be using Mentimeter um, to interact with you and sort of really get in there. So if you thought you were going to be sitting back and relaxing and just putting headphones on and trying to get your emails done, think again. Um, you're going to have to be doing some work during this one. Um, so please either um, yeah, get your phones out um, and we'll be putting up some QR codes to link through and answer some questions on your phone as you go through as well. Um, so the more interactive you are with this, the better it is for everybody and the more we can tailor um, some of what we we're thinking of doing to how you want to work through with that. So first, let's look at, um, let's jumping into learning what it takes to be a constructive conflict resolver. Um, so I am going to jump to our first Mentimeter. So if you can scan that QR code on the screen or jump on menti.com and enter the code 27190478. Um, and what we want you to do is just to do a self-assessment. So how good do you think you are on your conflict skills? And you can see some of those live results coming through. Oh, someone thinks they're awesome, Sarah. You're lucky. It's probably, yeah. Yeah, you. Good to see that. Well, look at that. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation, Haley. I think this is going to be great. And I love the honesty around all of this. Thirty-six. I'm ma making sure we're going to be building all of this into our conversation as we go through. Now, Haley and I are pretty passionate about the topics we're talking about today. Um, I'm bringing that conflict resolution engagement expertise, I guess, to the conversation, and Haley's covering off really on her areas of expertise and passion. And so, for both of us today, we want to demonstrate what it is to walk together in this space, bringing our skills, bringing our expertise and knowledge to the table. So we hope you're all up for that challenge as well. Um, that's a pretty good result. That's 36 people, Hayley, that we've got answering those yeah, questions. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think, you know, I kind of like conflict skills. I'm excellent at starting conflict. <laughs> <laughs> I can really throw a spanner in, right? <laughs> How oh, look, that and get a resolution totally separate conversation, right? How do we navigate also, this? Sorry. I think this is one of the challenging things as we go through today. So, we're going to dive down into this. Hayley, do you want to jump onto that next screen? Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, 
So for those of you that haven't done any training and learning in this conflict space, welcome to the table, welcome to the screen. We're going to have some fun with it. For me, conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing. Conflict, what we do with it will make it constructive or destructive. And I love this quote by Kenneth Cloak, who says, conflict is simply a set of lessons waiting to be learnt. For me, conflict presents an opportunity, an opportunity to explore the differences or the problems that we have just encountered. Um, it doesn't necessarily become a good thing or a bad thing, but because so many of us are uncertain, those big emotions that come to the table when conflict happens, it gets in the way of decision making, of relationships, of pro problem solving. So for all of us, conflict will occur inevitably, whether it's in our home lives, in our work lives, um, and in our community lives. And it's for all of us being able to recognise that conflict is happening. Now, what do we do with it? For most people, there'll be this sense of, oh, squirmy in the tummy. I don't want to deal with it. For other people, they just have to get on and do it. Um, but sometimes it will, um, they've got so used to having a fight about it, for instance, it becomes very destructive. For those of you that have not had a lot to do with conflict, sometimes I talk about the, the impact of nature itself and, and that how the storms or the fires can be really destructive, but if managed well, they can also need, lead to new life. And I sometimes talk about this, that when we care for country and when we're doing slow burns um, and, and softer burns in country, it reduces those high intensive heat burn offs that, that spread rapidly. And so then it becomes a really great example of a situation that's managed well and can produce really good outcomes. When we don't manage it well, when we allow it to flame up and really get hot, that's when things start to crumble and fall down. Next slide, Hayley. So what are the causes of this conflict? And it's really a, a, a question that we often don't stop to think about. We get caught up in the conflict or caught up in being right or caught up in, oh, there's so much going on. What do we do with this all? Sometimes by taking a step back and asking yourself, hey, what, what's causing this conflict or what's driving this? It can help us to ask really constructive questions. Often we see in the conflict space that, conflict is informed by four things. The first is structure, powers and systems. So the, the thirst for more power, to have power over people can lead to conflict. Having power in decision making, big organisations having more control and influence in the smaller community groups. So these structural is issues can have a big impact on how the conflict plays out and how much influence you have in decision making. Another big cause of conflict can be resources and money. Obviously, how much money do we have can impact how much we can push forward into a legal space or how much information we can get and how many people we can pull into the conversation. Resources and money drive a lot of the conflict. When there's a lot of it, it can get prolonged. But also when there's a disproportionate representation of resources and money on one side to very little empowerment through resources and money on the other side, it can lead to unbalanced outcomes where decision-making is not fair. Other causes of conflict include information and situations. Have you got the right information? Can you get access to the right information? Perhaps how you're assessing the information. Um, and some of the examples might be around in the climate deniers and climate in people who engage in that space, you're interpreting data differently. And so that information itself becomes a source of conflict. And then, of course, causes of conflict, people People drive and flame conflicts. It's our interest, it's our values, and it's our behaviours. And so underlying the structure, the resources, the information, always is this element of people. And I think that that's where it gets tricky because we don't often know how to navigate those points of differences and, and how to have those hard conversations. So if you find yourself really struggling with how do I move forward to solutions, I really want you to take a step back and do a little bit of thinking around what might be driving this conflict, not just what is the outcome we want, but, but what are people's needs? What are their interests in this matter? 
Hallie, have I missed anything? Oh, I love the comment. I'm just looking at the chat function here. It gets you fired up. I love that it gets you fired up. I hope you can get you fired up around how, what we do with it then. And I think that's part of the challenge, isn't it, Hayley? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that especially in the sustainability world, I mean, the if I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, they just don't get it. Um, so it's just that that different interpretation of the same either circumstance or set of information or values and drivers in which you bring it, I think um, you can interpret something with overlaying it with your value system and your experience um, and that it gets really frustrating sometimes when other people don't have the same reaction that you do. Um, and I think sometimes that that sort of difference um, can really sort of just generate uh, conflict in the sustainability space. Um, yeah. And please, like, jump in the chat. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure that every one of you sort of said it as well. Like, you go and speak to a project manager on a site, and they're just like not interested. And you're like, how can you not be interested in this? We're trying to save the planet. Like, your kids won't have a world to live in if we don't do something. Um, and sometimes that passion that you can throw into things when it's not reflected and mirrored back at you in a conversation can really create um, a lot of that conflict in different situations for, in a sustainability world. Yep. Look, and it's very easy, I see this happening so often in all sorts of conflict places, for people to focus on their positions. This is what I want out of it. In the conflict resolution world, we talk about positions versus interests. And the position, um, when we get focused on that, it becomes all we're about, the only thing that we can see forward, the only pathway forward. And so the real challenge is to dive into those interests. What's underneath the surface? What are the values? What are the, the needs? What are the relationships? What are the financial? What are the environment impacts? You're adding more information and options to the table. And what that does, it creates multiple avenues forward rather than shutting down the conversation. And sometimes that requires us to change tack. Sometimes it requires us to ask different questions. Um, and we're going to go through some of the skills that can help us open up a conversation rather than shutting it down. Great. All right, this is a real doozy and I love this. So I'm really curious about um, what people's responses are. How do you, how does conflict make you feel? And so before I even dive into it, I'm just going to wait and see those responses that come up. Um, and you can probably hear in the background, I've got my kids home today and I can feel the conflict brewing in the background here. So uh, I'll uh, be very curious to see how my kids go. Uncomfortable, nervous, uneasy, tense, angry, shut down, stressed. What else have we got? Confused. There's some great words here. Challenged, frustrated. Tired, wired, emotional. I can't even keep up with them all. <laughs> Tense. I love sick. this. I love sad. I think that's a good one too. It can make you feel really all sorts of different emotions. Yeah. We're going to be sharing the results of all these word clouds with the slides as well. So don't feel like it's good to be able to get in there and sort of feel like I'm not alone. So <laughs> many people feel anxious, nervous and uncomfortable. Yeah. What I love about what I'm seeing is that it's really what, what's really interesting is we don't talk about how conflict makes us feel. In fact, mostly we try to avoid talking about conflict at all. And conflict itself has been something that's viewed as very negatively. What we see on TV is high conflict. What we see is the destructive sides of conflict. We're taught to avoid it. We're taught that it's a bad thing. So all these, these words that are popping up for us are really normal. A lot of people feel those things, big, messy, dark clouds, when we start to think about conflict. We're not taught how to lean in and engage with it. We're not taught how to navigate it so it can be um, creative and an opportunity. I guess I've had to do many years of work to be able to feel comfortable in the conflict space. It doesn't mean that I like it, but it, what it means is that I've managed to teach myself and develop skills and capacity to not feel so anxious, to not feel so nervous and not to feel so uncomfortable. In fact, for me, conflict provides, I say that, that mindset shift of an opportunity and a potential. What is it that I can learn from this? How can I try to problem solve around these things differently. So I find it really not surprising that all of these words that you've thrown in there are, are words that are really making us feel quite anxious. And this is my little boy, Archie. 
Archie, we're doing a big presentation today with lots of people and I need you to go away now for a little while. Is that all right? Okay. I'm just going to, Hayley, I'm going to just press mute for a moment while you can just take over. Yep. <laughs> Um, so I think the other thing is too, I'm reading through all of the results that are popping up all over my screen. And and whilst most of them are, you know, uh, are sort of, I would say like the sad end of the emotional spectrum, there are some really good ones you need too, like hopeful. You know, I think that um, the more you sort of learn to deal in this conflict space, you know that there's, you know, sometimes you have to go in there and have hard conversations in order to get to better places. Um, so I think it's really it's 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 good to be able to sit there and pull out a few of those those positive feelings that come in there as well because the more you get to go and do through uh, work through um, conflict in different ways, the more you know that sometimes um, like constructive conflict can actually lead to really great outcomes and changes. Um, so having difficult conversations um, can actually lead to great things and not just the unpleasantness of going through the difficult conversation. So it's really good to see a few of those words in there as well. Um, okay. And the other... something just to point out. Sorry? You go. No, I was going to say something, something to point out was um, many people don't know that um, uh, after I uh, finished working for the Infrastructure Sustainability Council, I moved into managing a dispute resolution association, which is where I met Sarah. Um, and it was a completely different world for me. I was so used to working in sustainability um, and, and working with people who are great at what they do. And, and stepping into that whole industry made me feel really uncomfortable because there are so many experts who work in this space. And I think from a career point of view, actually working with the best of the best in this space, um, I think I, I learned so much from it in terms of a personal development point of view. Um, and so I think that when you really lean in to really constructive conflict and really leaning into working on having difficult conversations, it does get easier every time. Um, and I can say that someone who's been, you know, managing anxiety and depression for her whole life, like this definitely makes me anxious, but I can definitely work through it um, and know that without having that, that really uncomfortable situation, you can't get to good places at the end. So yeah. Um, Look, at definitely someone... if this has triggered something for you, please reach out to me separately and we can have a chat. I don't want anyone to feel like this is putting them in a place of um, really emotional stress, but I think that it's good to sometimes push a few of those little boundaries and then push to another place. Sorry, Sarah, I interrupted you. No, that's all right. One of the interesting things that's coming out of research is that the this capacity to name how we're feeling. And so in the conflict space, it's really vital that we have this reflective capacity to, whether it's internally or verbally to someone else to say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. And even if we can't fix it, what it does, it shifts the chemical um, reactions that are occurring in our brain so that we're not driven by the emotions or the high emotion of it, the naming of how we're feeling, vulnerable, challenged, stressed, anxious, allows us to take a step back and better manage the situation we find ourselves in. So for all of you that might be navigating really complex projects, really complex issues, noting and naming how this conflict makes you feel is a really powerful and simple tool to allow you to feel less driven by that negative emotion, able to step into and lean into, okay, so what do we do with that now? Jumping back. Thanks, Hayley. Hayley, you've got a beautiful quote around this, but we all know that behaviour change is really hard. Humans actually don't like to engage in change. Change makes us feel unsafe. It makes us feel highly anxious. It can be an overwhelming feel of, I don't know what's going on. What's the impact going to be on me? Am I going to lose something? So it generates a whole pile of quite negative anxiety-driven reactions, which is a really difficult thing when we're asking people to try and change, change for our future, change for our environment. These seem really big and overwhelming things. So it's not surprising if you feel like it's just not moving anywhere or we just can't get them to change their minds and do what we need them to do. It's, you know, surely it's common sense. Why can't they do this? The natural thing is, unfortunately, change is really hard. Hayley, you've probably got some great stories around this. 
<laughs> probably too many and some that are rated not for this conversation. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, like I said, you sort of everyone who's worked in this space is you're constantly pushing barriers. So I think like a couple of decades ago, even um, getting people to use the phrase climate change was hard. Um, getting people to acknowledge that um, customers in the marketplace are asking for this. And so regardless of your own personal beliefs on climate change, um, you know, you're going to have to address this sooner or later. Um, a, a pushing people into a world of, of a space that they're uncomfortable with. If you've ever worked in um, industries where people have had long-standing appointments to their positions and all of a sudden the world's changing around them um, and they don't want to see or acknowledge that. Um, if you've worked in an organisation where there's a lot of groupthink yeah. going on and then all of a sudden you're the new person on the block and you sort of say something that doesn't fit in with uh, the, you know, the common way that things are happening, then that's hard. Um, so I think sometimes, you know, sometimes some changes for the better, most people sort of avoid that because it makes them feel more comfortable. It makes them feel safe on a very, you know, um, a caveman type uh, response. We love to work in groups. We love to assimilate to people. Um, we love to, you know, if you if you do any of those social experiments where people who move into a different group, they start speaking with the same accents. They'll start to mirror each other's gestures and mechanisms because they love the familiarity of it. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, trying to get people to step outside those norms um, and that comfort zone is just really difficult. And I think, too, um, it's I think a lot of people in our industry are constantly trying to get other people to change. And we don't spend enough time reflecting on ourselves and how we can change. Um, so one of the biggest things that sort of uh, uh, I've learned, sort of especially when I started working in the Supply Chain Sustainability School, is I talk to and interact with a lot of people who are doing courses on sustainability because they've been told they need to or because they want to to try and win work, not because they're uh, they're driven to learn more about this topic. And we can somehow, um, when we're constantly hanging around people who all believe what we believe, you can get this false sense of, but you need to want to do it for the same reason that I want to do it. And it's really hard to get away from that and at a personal level and realise that, hey, maybe some people want to know this not because they're trying to save the world, but because they're trying to make money. And that's a different motivation, but we want to get the same outcome. And I need to learn how to be different on how I interact with that and stop trying to make people want to uh, do things because of the reasons that I want to do them and just try and get them to do things because of the reason that they want to do them. So there's a, a a lot of this is sort of really sort of stemmed around trying to get other people to change, but also reflecting and, and recognising when you need to change. Yeah. Look, and I think that's so important in terms of a soft skill. The skill is around really how we engage with other people and, and recognising one that change is hard. And why is it hard? It's hard because it is fearful. People have a lot of fear. It's hard because it's uncertain and uncomfortable. It's hard because there is a lack of control for people who perhaps have always had power and control. And giving that up is really hard. Often people just want to be heard. And so if you're trying to create a sense of change, allowing them space to be heard, allowing them space to express those fears, those confusions, their own views, allows them and you then to have a very different conversation instead of forcing the change on them. It becomes, hey, tell me about why, why this matters to you so much and, and what can I do to help you be comfortable with this conversation? And so it's a really different, uh, I guess, skilled approach to helping create the conditions for constructive change. Next slide, Haley. jumping through. Um, so this is something that I, I'm really passionate about and it taps on into what Haley was just talking about, it, not just saying what they need to change, but also being aware of what role are we playing in this conflict? Because how you are, impacts how others respond. If you engage in some of these tough negotiations with quite um, a barrier, a, a strong approach, 
you come in and you're really clear on what happens next, it's going to leave very little room for the other person. And they'll naturally go on the defensive themselves. And as soon as they step into the defensive space of a conversation, it shuts down the potential for options and alternatives and resolution. So the challenge becomes how we as practitioners manage our own emotional intelligence. So being aware of how we are, how we're feeling and how that impacts others knowing that will then help us manage the emotional responses in others so we need to be aware of what we're doing in our soft skills how how we might be coming across and it's not just language there's this really powerful thing that happens with humans we have this um, radar that picks up intimate details of when there's a discrepancy between words and the nonverbal communications or actions. So when your words, you're saying all the right things, but but your the feeling you're giving across or your body language might be coming across as a little aggressive or condescending or you've just got to do what I can, the other people will stop listening to you because it's creating confusion. And you've probably seen this in politicians in the media and they're all saying the right words and they, you know, come and vote for us and we'll support these environmental things, but the actions or their body language just doesn't sit right. And we can't always put a name to it, but there's a disconnect. So in terms of yourself and being alert to how you are and creating consistency and integrity to your communication, what it's going to do is help others feel more comfortable, enable them to be able to hear you more readily. So how you are will impact on how they respond. It's the same thing that if you get caught up in the conflict of the moment, yeah. the anxiety or trying to push through, and you're getting, oh, we've got to do this really quickly, this energy pops up. And what it does, it spreads. And everyone will be starting to tap into that level of anxiety or frustration. My kids were just doing it, right? They were feeding off each other. They were getting a bit anxious and, and parents will know that, oh, we're about two seconds away from an argument. And so we all do it, but we've all got to develop our capacity to have this emotional awareness that what we do can either can, um, contribute to good outcomes or more difficult outcomes. Hayley, do you want to talk about that one before I dive into the next points? Um, no, I think you. I think you spoke about it really well. In and just, um, I, I think it is a hard thing to do to acknowledge sometimes, though, when maybe mm. you were the one responsible for the argument, not because of anything you said, yeah. or not because of any of the context of of the of the the content. Sorry, of the of the discussion, but merely mm. just the way that you approach the situation. Yeah, um, and that's not to say that other people walk in that room may have different they sort of, you know, you mirror their behaviours as well. Yeah. But I think it's 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 a big thing to take on that emotional intelligence step and step above it and say, yeah, you know what, I actually contributed to that because of the way I approached it and not because of anything to do with what I said. So I think you, you outlined that really well. Look, I'll I jump think, to the next slide for you. Oh, just before you do, there's a couple of key points here to recognise that when you're dealing with these difficult conversations, some people will be in survival mode. And that's because they're having to survive through um, the financial situations or high levels of change or um, they're just exhausted. They might have experienced, um, they might be victims to modern slavery or some other issue that has had a high cost. When people are in survival mode, they're less likely to engage in complex problem solving. And for all of you, if you're feeling that overwhelm, you know yourselves, it's harder to then kind of disengage and have really analytical conversations. So it's important to note where are the people at that you're dealing with? Are they able to engage in this complex work? Or do we maybe need to take a pause and, and do some work around nurturing our well-being, nurturing our mental health to help them move into a space where they can hear us, where they can process complex information? Because then together we can engage in mutual negotiations, mutual problem solving. And then the final part of that point is about mindset. And I want to pull us back to that slide we did around the words of conflict. You know, what do we think of when we hear those conflict words? And the challenge for all of you in this complex space is to be able to shift your mindset from one of this is going to be a fight, this is going to be really challenging, I don't want to do it, it's too hard, to Phew, it's going to be tough, but I'm up and I'm curious around what might be possible from this conversation. 
So how do people respond? We've just heard about how we might respond and our role in these conflict, complex and conflict situations. But it's also important to note that you'll encounter all sorts of people as you try to find ways forward. And it's important to recognise those responses or reactions from people because very often they are a reaction. It's like an instant thing. They're not so used to pausing and stepping in a more of a strategic response. They'll be instinctual and they'll blame. They'll seek to take control or be right. Maybe they avoid talking about the hard issues. Inevitably, people focus on the position and they get personal. Um, and I think we've all seen interviews of high profile people that have, instead of focused on the questions in hand, they'll throw insults at somebody. And what it does, it distracts everyone else from the key issues we're meant to be exploring. So people become personal, often as a way to avoid those hard conversations. People in conflict don't actually encourage questions. What they do is try to shut questions down what they'll often do is just do what I say. If you just do this, it'll be okay. And what that does, it devalues the other people. So being aware of how are those other people around us reacting, responding, um, what might be driving those responses and how can I listen to that to make them feel safe and better able to have this conversation? How are we going, Hayley? Good. Do you want to jump? I'm just going to flick to the next one. Yep. See if I can do this properly. Hey. So what drives this conflict? We thought this question would be really interesting for each of you, bringing your own jobs, your own roles, your own passions, um, and you'll all encounter different types of conflict. But we're curious to hear what drives the conflicts that you're engaged with? What What's making problems occur? What's getting in the way of conversations? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> this is what I want to see. I want to see those yeah. things that are getting in the way. What are the barriers? Because we can't actually start to manage the conflicts if we don't understand what are those barriers. And how often do we actually stop to think about these things? Not very often because we're so busy doing. So what have we got? Different backgrounds, power, misunderstanding, miscommunication, values, ego. You know, these are all people things, right? What else, Haley? What are what we seeing? Comfort zones, agendas, not listening, time. Time is a big one. Poor engagement, culture, money, personal characteristics. Cultures, yeah. Very often what drives these conflicts are points of difference and difference in personalities, difference in values, and it's these differences that we aren't very good at finding our way through, at navigating through. And so instead of becoming opportunities, they've become roadblocks, you know, and, and the more we don't deal with them, the higher those roadblocks become. And the interesting thing in the spaces that you all work within is that there'll be tiers and layers of conflict. So it won't just be this dispute we're having because of someone not agreeing to a particular contract. The dispute probably has been driven by values. It's probably been driven by money. They're motivated by a whole pile of other things. So it's hard when we just focus on the conflict itself without understanding that broader context, what's happening around us and what's contributing to these conflicts. What we see in the conflict resolution space is increasingly a recognition of the need to conflict map, for instance. And a mapping is our opportunity to kind of pause and whiteboard or um, brainstorm what are all the contributing factors that might be influencing decision making or might be influencing our capacity to find solutions. And so ego, culture, values, different agendas, priorities, passions, fatigue, all of that pays a part, but we don't talk about it and we don't explore it because we often don't know how those other people will react. So just doing this exercise here is a really great tool and example of how we can 
equip ourselves to have really different conversations. These different conversations will layer and increase our capacity to hear each other and work towards problem solving. I think what's interesting on there um, too, and just having a look at a few of those responses, Sarah, is that um, how we can be really emotional and how um, our interpretation of what's driving those conflicts. So there's some pretty charged phrases in there, I would say, yeah, um, like stupidity. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's the very like lack of knowledge is a polite way of putting it, but there's stupidity on the page. And I'm like, yeah, I reckon that there's been times when I've sat in a room arguing with someone and I'm just thinking, this person is an idiot. <laughs> like, <laughs> if they could only know, if they only had more information, if they only... If I can just give them more facts, then surely they would understand what we're trying to get to here. Um, and, you know, usually, and then, you know, like a few weeks later, you find out, no, it had nothing to do with stupidity or lack of knowledge. It was just that they were going through a divorce at home and nobody knew that, you know, like just there's a whole stack of things that build up in a person that you have no idea what's really driving them. But in the moment, it can be so easy to, to label it incorrectly. Yeah, and I think that, again, it's that matter of putting words to what we're feeling, what we are experiencing, and also having that good support around you. You know, Hayley, I've been the same as a mediator when I'm meant to be really neutral, and I am outwardly, but internally I'm feeling a whole pile of emotions like, ah, oh, why can't they just hear and why can't they listen, which is a trigger for me to say, okay, what I'm doing isn't working. I need to try something different. What can I do different to help find our way through? And and sometimes, look, I've just seen the word sexism pop up in here, and I, I think some of those issues are really real and critical, so it requires a different response. So, again, it's measuring the risk and the opportunity and how can we influence change in a really more constructive way. Definitely. There's a lot of really good stuff in here. Fatigue, lack of sleep. Oh, yeah. Don't we know it? <laughs> I mean, I think that's especially evident if you ever try and argue with a child. If they're tired, you've got no chance of having a, a sensible argument with a child. Yeah. Um, I think that's also true for everybody right now. The last few years yeah. have been really intense. Many of us are feeling burnout. Many of us are feeling exhausted as leaders. One of the interesting things I see is this creep of decision-making fatigue where it becomes increasingly hard to juggle all those moving parts that you're trying to do. It becomes increasingly hard to um, really be critical in your decision-making and you will probably fall back into bias. You'll probably fall back into the just do it comfort zone because it's easy. And it's not that anyone's been a bad leader, been a bad person. It's just that you're fatigued. So being able to recognize how you're feeling and to be aware that that will impact the engagement, the communication, and particularly how you navigate these conflict zones. Because in conflict, it intensifies everything that we're feeling. When we put our toes into that water, we know automatically that we will be feeling more we're more alert, there's higher risk. So it's just juggling those things. All right. So for those of you that haven't done any conflict training, this is like, this is just 101. We're just we're putting our toes into water and there's a little ripple. But it's important to understand that there is quite a cycle of conflict. And it's very easy for us to get caught in the cycle of and just feel like we're going around and around and around in circles and nothing's changing. Generally, conflict will emerge when there's a point of difference or a confusion. Mostly, we can navigate those points of difference or a confusion between the other person pretty simply. And this is low-level disputes, confusion, perhaps with a work colleague, perhaps with your partner, who's getting dinner out tonight and someone's forgot. So there's, there's some tension points around this. And, and most of us are able to respond to it really early and it's done and dusted. And, and we don't think of it again. It, it's, it's been and dealt with. But when we don't address those points of difference or confusion early, the conflict escalates. It steps up to the next level. And in this place, we become 
in a sense, more resentful, more positional and more combative because we feel often our needs haven't been met, we haven't been heard, the issue wasn't dealt with. So we've kind of stewed on it for a little while. Um, You know, you might have been in a workplace and your colleague talks very loud and it's all right for a little while, but it just, you know, you've had a conversation with them about it and they just haven't changed their behaviour. And so it continues and your level of frustration rises very quickly. And from what was, hey, they just talk too loud, you're feeling really frustrated because they talk too loud and they don't listen to anyone and they think they know everything. And so it layers on levels of complexity. And this is true in complex matters. So the dispute has escalated to another level. What then happens is that it really embeds into a deeper level of dispute or disagreement, a real conflict. This is hearty here. Parties are unable to negotiate an outcome together. So when there's an opportunity of escalation between two parties to resolve themselves, great. But when they can't resolve it together, it becomes embedded and Generally, what happens is we turn this into a fight, a fight to be right, a fight to win, to fight to have the outcome that that we need. And that's often when we need help to navigate our way through. And so whether it's a work colleague, a mediator, a Um, your boss or someone neutral from outside, often that's when we need someone to help us listen better, someone to help us hear what matters to the other person because we've stopped listening, someone to help us really think about, oh, well, how might we resolve this? Instead of staying stuck in the conflict itself, we've got to transition towards a resolution. And a resolution doesn't have to be a perfect outcome. And I think this is part of the challenge we all face when we talk about resolution. We think that resolution needs to be a perfect solution, a a perfect rainbows and fairy tales outcome. And sometimes that's just not possible. And the best we can hope for is an outcome we can live with for now. And at least that's something that's giving us something to move forward with. So I, I want to challenge you all, I guess, as part of this is to think about when you hear resolution, are you looking for that rainbows and fairy tale ending, which would be fantastic, but what can we do today to at least be able to allow us to live with this for now? Because that's a step forward towards that bigger picture. It allows us to keep moving rather than becoming entrenched in it has to be this this vision as opposed to that vision. So being open to what can we live with for now is better than not getting an agreement at all. I think that's a really important point you make there, Sarah, because I think most people who don't work in this era will hear a whole lot of things. Like there's a thousand podcasts out there around how to get to win-win, that, you know, you're both going to walk away happy, that, you know, um, you know, that's the whole point of actually going through this is that you both get get exactly what you want out of it, that you're both happy, that you're joyous, that you can walk out and shake hands and smile. Um, and that's just unrealistic, right? You know, and and in reality, if you walk away smiling and happy, it's probably going to fall over because it means the other person is going to be terribly unhappy. Um, and there's no balance being reached there in that, you know, once you've, when, you're, when you're trying to resolve a conflict, the best you can hope for is something you can both live with, right? You know what I mean? Like it's that mentality of, of what happens. Um, I think the other point you made there that was really interesting is around the the disputes and disagreement space because I know that once it gets to that point, usually that's when people will start to develop oh, like a confirmation bias of behaviours. Yeah. So it's kind of like I get to this point and it's like not only does do they just keep talking loudly in the office, but now they're deliberately doing it just so I can't do my job properly you know, yeah. and they sort of, they start to see things that aren't even there and use them as justifying other conspiracy theories going on in their heads. And then it just like makes it even worse. Yeah. And it and it fuels that cycle and we um, become more and more exhausted by it. Yeah. I want to just jump onto the next slide, Hayley, and talk a little bit about high or complex conflict. And the reason why this is important for all of you is that the spaces that you work in are complex conflict. They are often high conflict and high conflict as opposed to high conflict personalities. What I'm talking about is these conflicts that and disputes that are live 
and sustained. They've generally been going on for probably six months plus, as opposed to a workplace dispute that has occurred over the last couple of months. These high complex cases are often multi-party, so they involve more than two stakeholders in it. So there's layers to any agreement that might be reached. Um, there's layers to the contributing barriers and influences. In this space, this high conflict space, people tend to react with high emotions, often because they feel very passionately about these issues. So, um, for instance, the native title um, conflicts, conflicts that occur, of course, these are high emotional issues because they are deeply personal about culture, about land access, about um, who we are as a person. So, of course, they are high emotions. The same would be true for some of the environmental issues. Um, people are reacting not just about less uh, non-emotive issues, but very deeply emotive issues. So parties also tend to be highly positional, which means that they will demonstrate difficult negotiation behaviours. And they're highly positional because they care so much, because it matters so much. And so these high conflict spaces are necessarily much harder to navigate. They require a higher level of skill and understanding around what is the context, what are the influencing factors, how might people respond. Often we find we have to chunk up negotiations in this space because trying to resolve the whole conflict is not going to be possible right now because it's going to get in the way of everything else. So sometimes we'll find that in these spaces we get little wins and we build in <clears throat> layers to the story so that we can manage these little aspects of the high conflict and not get overwhelmed by it all because it can be very overwhelming. So I want to acknowledge that for all of you in this space, there's probably elements of this high conflict and that there's not a lot of talk that happens around that, that space. So I'm happy to have questions later on about that as well. Okay, so you've so talked a little gonna... bit. Sorry. No, you go. Yep. I was just going to say, we've talked about conflict. I've given you a quick 101 into it, but we wanted to give you some skills. We wanted to give you things that you can walk away from this session with. And we've created, I guess, the opportunity for some tension in a conversation as well. We've got this notion of create and resolve constructive conflict. Honey, I want to just hand over to you because you, you put this slide together initially. Tell me a little bit about what you're thinking. Yeah, well, I suppose, um, and this is something that uh, Sarah and I have spoken about a little bit in that the sort of the skills and development of people who work in the sustainability space is we're constantly pushing people outside their comfort zone. We're, we're deliberately creating that conflict so that we can create change. Um, and I think that that, um, that has an entirely, you know, how do you do that in a way that gets results as opposed to getting people to put their backs up? And I think that um, especially now we're moving into an era of, you know, all of the people who, and I always, oh, I'm trying to think of a nice way to put this, but um, a lot of the time, I think we've sort of moved into a space now where some people are preaching to the choir, that they like to, to speak to people who already believe what they believe. And then there's this majority of people that we need to convert over to our way of, of changing things in order to, you know, just do little things like save the world. Um, and so we have to move into the areas of where it's, there's no friendly territory here. Um, so we need to be able to get a, develop a new skill set of really talking to an entirely different group of people, how to create that really constructive conflict and then resolve it. And I'm talking about like, you know, um, and I deliberately mean constructive conflict here is to try and generate something like a positive outcome as opposed to just fighting about things or yeah. um, deliberately being um, positional about things. So the next, this next session, I think that we're going to take you through is sort of let's, you know, and we're going to get you to do some work here as well around the <clears> skills. <throat> what sort of skills do we need to develop in order to create that constructive conflict and then to resolve it? And like I did joke at the start saying I'm really good at creating conflict. I think it's really good to be able to throw a spanner in the works um, and sort of challenge those things. But what skills do we need in order to do that um, as opposed to resolve them? Did that explain everything, Sarah? Or am I just... Yeah, we're going to have some, you're going to get some more insight as we go through this. Let's jump to the next slide, Hayley. Yeah. And what skills do people who are great, hang on, let's jump 
to the slide. Who are great? What skills do great conflict creators need? I'm really curious. Hit me with your ideas around this. Um, and we're going to unpack that a little bit. And I'm going to tell you some stories about what I see. But what have we got cropping up? Listening, openness. Yep. Calmness, questioning. Look, I think this is such a critical conversation that many people have never had before. What is it to create constructive conflict and do we need to do it? I I know myself that I know very few people that can generate the space for really difficult conversations well because what they do is they fall into a combative, combative approach or they fall into this kind of arrogancy about the conversation. I know best, you know, why aren't you doing this? And so it, what it does, it puts the other person into a really difficult position around, well, they don't want to hear from me, you know, and, and you feel defensive straight away. So they are specific skills and very few people that do this well. When you do this well, it what it does, it generates a sense of curiosity. It generates people with the capacity to say, oh, I hadn't thought about that before. And so I think that that's the skills that are going to help you create change in the longer term. It's doing it and having hard conversations in a way that allows empathy, that allows curiosity, and that allows um, vulnerability in our hard conversations. There are some amazing words popping up on here, Hayley. Yeah, definitely. And I think a few of them that we thought would come out too, which was really handy to see. Yep. Um, And thank you everyone for engaging as um, productively as we are, because it makes the conversation easier and that's a good way to interact and getting in there. I think some of the good ones that I see in there that um, are courageous. I think it's incredibly, you need to be brave, right? (laughs) Like, in order to sit there and just sort of take it on, especially knowing that what you, what's going to come next, sort of stepping into that world where you're going to have a, a difficult conversation, stepping into the uncomfortableness is really hard. Um, so I think that you're right. Courage is definitely a big one. Um, I think understanding, listening and patience are all really good things because I think sometimes you really need to get in there. Imagination, not judging, open-mindedness, they're all sort of, these are all sort of really good traits of people. Yeah. Um, and there are definitely some skills that you can learn to sort of help you be better in this space. Um, I think sometimes, especially when you're you're stepping into this, um, we're so used to authoritative power structures that sometimes when you're sort of stepping in to create it, you know, it must be, you know, only the boss can make that change or, you know, um, who are you to sort of step in? So you might come in overly strong on the, I'm an expert in this space, which then can put people combative in that in that sense as well. So it's interesting to see some of these words pop out that I can sort of, I can totally imagine the circumstances in which that um, people have used these skills in order to, you know, sort of really sort of start those difficult conversations. And one of the words that jumps out for me, Hayley, is this word there about strategy and how important strategy is. And I think that that is really key here. It's understanding what are you working towards? Because if you've got your eye on the longer term prize, it allows you to um, not focus on the immediate battle. So you can let things slide. You can let people be heard. You can, hey, it's all right if I... Um, don't have control right now because we're playing towards a longer game. And so I think that is really important around having that clarity. I say it all the time to people, pick your battles. Is this a battle we need to have or are we playing a longer game here? And so that's really important. But also if we flip these words, Hayley, we can suddenly start to say, okay, so when we don't do this well, these are the things that aren't happening. So if you find yourself in a difficult conversation and it's not going very well, maybe have a pause and think about what is it from this list that I'm not doing or they're not doing and how might I take a different step? What might I do differently to make this more constructive? Uh, Someone's put cultural awareness at the top of the sheet there too. I think that's a really key one um, in this, in that like where and when and how you start to have that conversation can be very different. The whole public shaming issue is culturally sensitive and also not great for people who you know are going to be really authoritatively responding. Yeah. So challenging your boss in a meeting of 50 people is probably not the best place to do that. Mm. Sensitivity. I think too around um, it's 
questioning our assumptions around all these things. When we assume, when we make assumptions about what we know, how we're experiencing it, where they're at, that's where we get into problems. So I think this capacity to ask questions with curiosity, to lean into these assumptions and bring them to the surface, it becomes more powerful. Hayley, we might just jump on to that um, soft yep. skills next slide. I'm conscious of time and I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for our yep. hypothetical. So we had a few of them in there. So that's, I think that's great. I think respect. Yep. So I think that a lot of those um, respect, empathy, curiosity, pause your own judgment on issues, reality testing the situation, being reflective, I think is one that didn't pop up on that list. Yep. Um, having really clear goals of what you're trying to achieve by creating that conflict and not just conflict for conflict's yep. sake. Being brave, psychological safety was one that sort of, I think a few of those other skills sort of sort of come into that space around um, creating an environment in which the other person feels as though they can engage rather than be defensive. Um, and I think that's around the listening, the empathy, the I mean, cultural awareness, all of those things I think sort of fit into that psychological safety box as well. Hey, we've got a quick question. I see a hand up from Monica. Do we want to? Yeah, Monica. Hi, I have a question, and I guess it comes to the culture of the construction industry, which I have heard is uh, highly litigious and full of conflict between contractors. Uh, and I hear this primarily from you know, consulting engineers. And I would be interested in how you develop, how one changes that culture through this kind of, of framework? Thanks. Great question. I have just written it down, Monica. I think that culture change is a really big issue and it takes time. We, we need to model the process of, of the soft, soft skills and doing it well. We need to make sure we're creating this capacity in our allies in the industry and creating conversations around why it matters. Also, there's this notion of developing the evidence that reinforces why this approach is better than the litigious approach. There's a time and a place for a litigious approach, but I think increasingly the the research and the, the say, for instance, the um, Singapore Convention on Mediation is getting some incredible results from mediation of construction industry issues, which builds a pool of case studies to reinforce this notion of, hey, we don't have to have a fight about it. Yeah, I think as well, like Monica, I totally agree with you that it's a fairly contentious sort of space. However, I also believe that that's just because the people who are currently in those situations, it has been a long standing, uh, like the rules of the game. And the people who are in the top jobs know the rules and they, they've they gotten to their top jobs because they've played the game well. And so uh, keeping up those appearances in terms of maintaining that high level of litigiousness and argumentativeness is just a way of reinforcing because it's that Pavlovian, Pavlovian response, right? I've spent my entire career sort of assimilating into this culture and I've succeeded and I'm getting rewarded because I keep escalating up the channel by exhibiting these behaviours. Um, and yet when you go and meet on them individually, often their individual personalities are very different to that that they'll exhibit in a group sense um, from anybody in those settings. Um, and I think we've certainly found that with the way that people engage in methods. So if you're in a non-competitive space, people are looking uh, quite happy to collaborate. They can get in there, you can get to know people differently. We can talk through um, and have different approaches to being able to generate different ideas. Um, but I think it's going to take a long time to sort of break down that entire power structure that people have been rewarded for that behaviour for so long that, um, as Sarah said, the only thing we can really do is exhibit a new behaviour and show that there's success in that and then watch and see, show the different um, a different game or change the rules of how people can play and succeed in this space, which is a bit different as well. And let's jump through to the next couple of slides so that we can yep. cover off. So what skills do we do people who are great conflict resolvers need? Much like we did just before, I'm curious to see. So the previous one was about great people who can like start difficult conversations. This one is around just, yeah, how do we pull it together? How do we wrap it up? How do we allow people to be heard and resolve yeah. the issues? Oh, 
patience. <laughs> Don't we all need patience? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of patience by looks of that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that we often assume that people naturally come with the skills to be good conflict resolvers. We think about good leaders and, and we say, oh, yeah, they know how to deal with those people problems. They have, know how to do this. And we don't actually invest a lot of training and development in around how do we develop our capacity to be good conflict resolvers. So it's not often skills that we learn anywhere. In fact, most people learn these skills from growing up from their home environments. and so. I think increasingly what we see in business schools and universities is a recognition that the skills of conflict resolvers are what's going to help us navigate moving forward. No bias or agenda, embracing difference, wear the other hat, able to look for potential, creative, good place, flexibility, uh, negotiation. I can see some people here have done conflict resolution training because they're using some uh, particularly industry specific words which is fantastic compassion <laughs> yeah. empathy understanding patience lots of questions keep the outcome in mind again these are really great examples of the skills that people can bring to the table to help us to be better conflict resolvers and not just conflict resolvers to help us be better humans I think Hayley Absolutely. Interesting one there around facts versus fiction. So I think that the one thing just to be mindful of um, in this space is um, everybody has their own version of the truth. Yeah. Um, so I always, and I've said this a number of times, so apologies if you've heard me say it before, but I once had, um, had a chat with a Cherokee elder um, and he was explaining to me the difference um, in that over um, in Canada where he was from that often when they go to court, they're asked to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, and to which they say, no, I can't because there's no possible way that I can tell you my truth and I can tell you my truth as I believe it to be today. But I cannot tell you the whole truth because that's impossible. Um, and that um, an individual's perception of the truth may change over time because you will pull from that instance what you needed to hear that at that day. And in a future time, you will pull from the same instance a different learning than what you needed to be for that day. So I think it's always interesting when you look at facts versus fiction, um, when you're passing judgment on what you believe fiction to be, um, just be mindful that that is going to be a whole, what is the truth um, can change. Um, and yeah, you might be the one that you might think that you're telling the truth, but it turns out that it may not be the whole truth. Look, I always say that there's your truth, their, their truth and everything in between. Um, but it I mean, is really yeah. important that we're also making space for evidence and examples and balancing the emotive from the factional, from the rational. So it's sometimes those things are around pausing emotions and bringing in another aspect of information. So the more information we can get on the table, the better our decision making is. Let's jump through to those soft skills, Hayley. Um, and look, we what we put on the list included active listening, reframing, risk management skills, future focus, neutral and fair, problem solving, emotional intelligence, compartmentalization, which means being able to kind of park some issues and, and focus on what's important right now. Having thick skin is really important because this is hard work, right? And we, we, we have to be able to hold this space. So you can see there from this list and your list that the skills of a good conflict resolver are numerous and that we probably all need to be investing in this for um, the way that we do our work well. Next slide, Hayley. So how do we respond to these challenges? First of all, always this notion of staying calm. I know it's easier to say than it is to do often, particularly in the heat of the moment. But I always encourage people to um, find a tool or a reminder or a practice that helps you take a breath. And it might be simply take a breath, but it might be doing a meditation or it might be recognising there's a whole pile of stuff going on that people are trying to draw you into the conflict. If you get drawn into it, you're less able to make good decisions. Making choices, choosing a ceasefire rather than continuing the fight. Using tactical empathy, which is allowing people to be heard, 
feeling like you're recognizing them, but giving them some choice whilst also um, being mindful of what you're working towards. There's some great research around tactical empathy as a particular skill. Language is so important and powerful, but we can get it wrong and our language might not be the same as someone else's. So it's being mindful of those things and how we hold the space, how we make space to deal constructively with conflict as opposed to turning it into destruction. I've got a number of examples here and I'm, I'm pretty sure, Hayley, this slide is going to go out to everyone to have access yeah. to. So hit us up with your questions because I... I want you to feel like we're available to talk about it, that, that if it doesn't quite land or it doesn't sit right, let us know and we'll unpack it a bit more. One of the examples I often use when you're going into a difficult conversation is to frame that conversation. When we frame it, we put a bit of a boundary around what we're going to talk about. And that helps contain the emotions or the complex issues. So instead of being bombarded by everything, we're kind of chunking up this conversation. And it might be, this is a difficult conversation and it may be difficult to hear, but it's important for me to create some clarity. And I hope that in understanding what is what going forward, we might be able to do better. What I'm doing when I'm framing a conversation is acknowledging or naming those tension points. We talked about right at the beginning about naming how we're feeling. Sometimes we also name that for the others. Hey, this is going to be a really difficult conversation. And I know that it's hard to hear, but I'm really up for it. And I hope that you can feel heard and that we can both be working towards something. So framing the conversation helps you anticipate those tension points and allows you to focus the conversation. And again, we're trying to get everyone to move forward rather than staying in the blame space of looking backwards. We have empathy. We focus on problem solving. This notion of future focus for complex issues is really critical because it's very easy for all of us to slide back into blame. Blame is very natural. It's always easier. It's their fault or they're not doing this or they're not doing that. It allows us to absolve ourselves of responsibility as well. So in your language, trying to frame as, hey, I know this is really difficult, but what might we do today to help us move forward into the future? Hey, I know this is really bad and I acknowledge that this has been painful, but if we stay talking about that, we're going to miss the opportunity to problem solve. So again, the language that we use will help us navigate that. Hayley, anything that I've missed from that one? No, we're good. No, Excellent. Think, yeah, great examples. <laughs> um, so here is just a, a little slide and I'm not going to over-focus on it. It's just an example of process. Good process helps us have difficult conversations. What it does, again, it's putting out that roadmap of the steps we're going to follow. In high conflict and in conflict situations, we become emotional. It leads to confusion. Confusion leads to conflict. When we step out process, it allows us to know, oh, this is what's happening next. We don't have to focus on what, what's my job next, what do I do next, because we've got those steps laid out. And it is about how we prepare, how we explore together, how we problem solve. Okay, we've problem solved this really well, but now we need to wrap up the conversation so we close. But it's not just finished then because you have to action. And this is where I see a lot of well-intentioned negotiations and problem solving fall down because they've reached an agreement, but they haven't thought about the practical application. And then when it doesn't action or doesn't happen, we lose faith in the process. So these are some really clear examples of a good process. Hayley, let's jump on. <laughs> Yeah. So the next step is around a sort of remediation, which is sort of making right. So a lot of people have heard of the term remediation. Um, it's commonly popped up these days in um, modern slavery work. So as you go through and do your analysis, you find out things and then you need to remediate them. Um, but it's been in, remediation is sort of just think of it in terms of making things right at the end of the day. Um, so sometimes when you when you work through a conflict, trying to you get to the point of where you've talked it all out and then you have to go, well, so what? How do we fix this? you know, or at least try and repair it to some level. How do we make right on what's happening? So in order to do that, we're going to um, jump into back into our Mentimeter and really sort of talk through about what are some of the things that most people want out of the end of a, at the end of a conflict? Um, what sort of things are people looking for in an agreement after you've had a fight about something? Um, and just to sort of put it out there that there's, you know, what do, what do people want out of the resulting out of the back end of it? So... You should be able to jump into the next one now. 
What does a good outcome look like? Yep. Yeah, right. what does a good outcome look like? These are some great words around a way forward, feel heard, money, consensus, agreement. There actually is no wrong answer here because what a good outcome looks like will be different for everybody. And that's the great opportunity and the challenge, right, around how do we create clarity around what it is to fix this or make this better. When we assume what it looks like, that's where our negotiations will often stumble. So again, it's a question like this is an opportunity for you to refine your questions, help you understand what are the questions that might help us move towards solution quicker. <laughs> a medal, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Everyone walks away with a medal. Feel heard, apologies, a new process, action items, positive change, mutual understanding. Hayley, I can't wait to get all these results together in the end and be able to share them. I know, with common ground, yeah. positive change. I think and action that, items is a good one, but I think let's try and get more specific about what those action items may be because I think that the point of us sort of putting this slide together is sort of to get your idea about it, but then um, as we go into the, the next slide for us too, it's sort of talking through, um, you know, there can be a number of things that come out of an agreement um, and it really can be varied and I think that sometimes if you go down a very um like Monica was pointing out before like a very litigious route can give you a very specific outcome so um for example um oh, I'll give you one that most people so it, you know uh, in certain legislation there are very prescribed remediation actions that can come out of that act um and that you know, a judge or a jury or anyone else in that in that sense can only give you a limited number of responses from taking that that court action, and most of the time that doesn't make anyone feel satisfied. Um, oh, so you, you often see families sort of walk out of court after you know someone's just being convicted of murder. Um, they walk out and they go, "Well, they got seventeen years in jail, but that doesn't feel like enough." Um, because they weren't actually looking like what did they get out of that whole process so I think it's really sort of sitting back and looking at it to go well, what do people want out of it um, and I think apologies someone's put up there sometimes uh, that's it just an acknowledgement you know sometimes Hayley it would look like things like someone will want a job out of this someone will want some education somebody will want to have a fund developed for future cases somebody will want a bunch of flowers every six months just to know that they are valued. So what the yeah. outcome, the more specific you can be, the more meaningful it is for people. And it's a really important lesson for all of you, I think, is when making and reaching these action items, the more specific you can be, you know, the time frame of tight, tight time frames around it, that's what's going to create meat to an agreement. That is what helps it land and be meaningful going forward. Hayley, I think we just jump through the next slide yeah. and I want to go straight into this hypothetical. Yeah, so I think we've gone just for making sure we've got everything in there. Yeah. So now jumping into this hypothetical. Okay, so here's where we're going to try and put it into practice. Um, and I've tried to make this hypothetical as realistic um, for, for MECLA members as we can. Um, so here we have a small country town. It's a border town. Uh, between two different states. Half of the town is in one state, the other half is in another state. Um, they've had a wooden bridge. Um, in this town, the shops and the schools are on one side and the airport. On the other side, there's hospitals, fire, police. Um, the town is a major connecting point between other regional centres for transport, people, everything else that goes along with that. Um, there's a, a very strong and preserved local Indigenous site right near the base of the bridge. Um, that has been uh, an active um, ceremonial site for many, many thousands of years. And in recent times, in the last 12 months, um, the wooden bridge that, uh, that goes over this river that joins the two halves of the town, the two states, the, the community together, um, has either been burnt down or flooded away in different um, extreme weather events um, as it's come through. And the, the replacing that bridge five times um, has now bankrupted this town. 
So our very cranky mayor has come out, um, is very upset at the fact that they've had to replace this bridge five times in 12 months from these extreme weather events, and has said, that's it. I'm declaring that climate change has caused the increased severity of all of the fires and floods that have taken out the bridge, and those who cause climate change should be held responsible for the town's expenses. Had enough. So there's two things, two claims that he's now going and doing. Essentially, the town is now suing the steel and concrete manufacturers. Um, the damage occurred while the steel and concrete manufacturers were carrying out their business activities. He thinks that's claimable under their public, liabil uh, public liability insurance. Because they were emitting carbon into the atmosphere, it's now caused climate change. Climate change has destroyed my bridge five times. Therefore, um, I'm going to start suing you for me needing to replace my bridge five times. The second part of the hypothetical is that um, the mayor is also suing um, the designers, constructors and the timber suppliers of the of who's made those five bridges over the past 12 months, um, because he believes that under the Trade Practices Act, the remedies for repair and replacement of goods, compensation for loss and damage and refunds are, are applicable here. Um, and they think that the, the timber manufacturers have breached their statutory obligations to consumers because the material is not fit for purpose as it does not withstand the Bureau of Meteorology forecast for climatic conditions of repeated fire and flood. <laughs> so no doubt <laughs> you will think, I mean, you know, I've had a lot of fun creating that particular hypothetical. <laughs> Um, and tried to sort of put a finger on everybody in the Meckler circle in this um, as to what can happen. But I think that it's a fun one, it's a hypothetical, but something that we've all joked around with could actually be reality one day of sort of going, well, you know what, Bureau of Meteorology have put it out there, we've got to start like making sure that we can meet these conditions. So what I want you to do is to jump on this slide um, and really sort of identify out of all of that, there's a lot happening in that scenario. What are the key issues that we need to be resolved? Um, and this is sort of a, a test of all of, of exactly of where all these skills that you've developed over the last hour or so have gotten to and really sort of coming into play with, um, well, what is it? What are we actually trying to figure out here? Um, there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of stakeholders. There's a lot of competing interests. You know, there's um, a stack of NGOs are all interested in this. They're watching to see what happens because it might set a precedent. Um, I'm sure the different state governments had different plays about getting involved in other side of the border. Hey, you know, press there's center. a lot of stuff that's going on in here. Press enter. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, so the mayor's desired outcome. He wants money. His council has gone bankrupt. So he needs money to sign fill the coffers and he doesn't want his bridge to burn down again. So we've got here planning. Placement of bridge, is that appropriate? Bridge. Yeah, looking for someone to blame. Yep, yep. probably. Great question. Who are the stakeholders? The time frame or stage resolutions, accountability? These are all really important questions that as we start to navigate complex issues, the process of mapping out those questions, what do we need to know to make good decisions is really vital. I think the one there that the town feels as though it's been compensated, I think is really important. So I think that it's not just that they might have been financially compensated for what it is, but that the town feels as though that they've been heard and that they've 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 been rectified. I think that's an entirely different type of compensation. Um, and it's whoever put that one up there, hats off to you. I think it's really pointed to, to sort of point out. And there's tensions around all of these issues too. So the, the question around who is responsible for, for climate change, it, you, the town itself might even not need an answer that. They might just need to be heard. They might just need, yeah. hey, help us navigate this. What can we do next to, to find our way through? So I think that, again, recognising and understanding what are the needs of people in this dispute. Yeah. I think you're right there. Even what resources do we have? Like, does anyone have money to be able to pay for this? Is that even an option? Um, improving the design? Yeah. Just making sure we haven't skipped anyway. And yeah, and look, I think that this is kind of, it, it, it's really interesting because I think I deliberately put something in there around climate change but they don't you know they probably don't actually want to resolve climate change they just want to get a bridge that works so that 
You know, mm. kids can get to school and people can get to the hospital when they need to and people can buy their fruit and veg. Yeah. I love the diversity of answers that we're getting here. It really shows yeah. that you're thinking about this and thinking about problem solving from multiple perspectives. Hayley, let's jump on to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to jump into the next point. And we've spoken a lot about processes. So really sort of coming back to these, what are the key processes um, that we need to go through in order to get this outcome? So Sarah's spoken through a couple of generic ones in there, but just putting all of the facts of the matter aside, if you're coming in here and your job is to try and resolve this issue, let's talk through some processes. I'm going to spend um, two minutes on what steps? What are the key process steps? What do you need to feel like you could engage in yeah. this process safely or constructively? It's a different question. We don't often stop to think about it because we are often focused on the dispute itself, what's going on. The conversation, stakeholder forum, specific solutions, listening to everyone. stakeholder forum, stakeholders at the table, this notion of yeah. who are the right people to be involved and who has authority to make decisions? Who yeah. do we need to get involved? How do we manage the um, people dynamics of that space, which can be really complex when stakeholders might be yeah. really clear, but they might also be complex. There might be um, division in stakeholder groups themselves, which often creates uh, blockages to constructive negotiations. Analysis, brainstorming, listening to everyone. Where are the scientists? Good question. Another important people at the table. <laughs> Facilitator, review, resolutions. Hayley, some of the, um, the process points that we talked about when we were asking and exploring this process element ourselves, we talked about the need for an agenda. What are we talking about? So it creates, again, yep. that, that boundary around this complex conversation. What are the key topics? Where are those marker points that we're going to talk about? We talked about the need for good preparation. Preparation includes identifying, identifying all those right people, but what is the information we need to make right decisions? What are the facts? What are people's concerns? Have we given people the skills to be able to engage in this conversation? Because if you bring them all together, it's a bit of a melting pot of chaos. So again, what can we do to help prepare them to engage more effectively? We need to explore the issues. We need to make sure that there's breakout spaces or private sessions, as we call in the dispute resolution world, because you can't always have a conversation or a hard conversation in front of everyone else. So it's giving people dignity, honouring their need for, at times, difficult um, advice or conversations and reality testing that allows them to save face or get legal advice or really be vulnerable in their conversations. Um, we also talked about the need to the drafting of an agreement and how important that is to a good process the negotiation process itself, and distinguishing decision-making from a written agreement because the process of decision-making takes time and just because we've made a good decision, we then need to articulate that in a really clear agreement. Again, there's a negotiation that happens around all of that and a rigorous agreement will help stipulate the action items to follow. So we talk about then we've got an agreement the implement, implementation phase, and then the follow-up and review, hey, what worked well, what didn't work well, what can we learn and share with other people, what might we have done differently? That follow-up and review is a really critical opportunity to share with yourselves and others around how might we do this better next time or how might we help others not have to go through this level of conflict. Excellent. And look, I think a few people have identified a few of those in there, but I think that, you know, in terms of um, actually sort of sitting there and planning and mapping that out, I think that really sort of giving giving space to all of that, and we'll put the list that Sarah just spoke through, we'll put in the slides and make sure that's available for you all as well. Because um, I think a few of the points that Sarah spoke about are being completely missed off this list. Um, but I think they're just appreciating that there is a process to go through. Um, and sometimes that can just hold everybody together as you move yeah. through the different points of that. 
Um, but I think everyone's identified the, the initial ones around kicking yeah. things off quite well. Look, and I think too, for all of us, when we find ourselves in conflict navigating conflict and problem solving it is really vital that we create a good process that there's transparency about the process that we're all going to follow that doesn't mean to say that process is stuck we can always negotiate it but the more transparent and consistent you are in that the less chance there is for confusion around um, the process itself so we're reducing out one of the risks of continuing or an escalation of conflict so get your process right negotiate that process and then lean into the the content and the difficult conversation what you'll find it does reduce confusion and chaos increases the chances of a better conversation it is really part of your risk management process all right Hayley, i think we yeah i was gonna say <laughs> that's kind of the end of where we got to with um yeah. with, and we're working through there um and like i said we're going to provide all the slides and everything through there but to round things out at the end what we really want you is to sort of sit there and reflect so at the very start of this presentation we asked you what do you think your conflict skills are um and so now we want you to sort of jump back in there and go well now that you've sat through that how good do you think they are um and we're going to compare them as the two at the end When Sarah and I were thinking about this, we're like, this can either go either way. And we've seen it go either way in that um, either people think at the end of it that they're not as good as they thought they were at the start because they now know a whole bunch of things that they didn't know <laughs> <laughs> um, and realised, you know, that whole Dunning, it's like where you are on that Dunning-Kruger effect, right? <laughs> if you're blissfully ignorant, you think you're awesome and now you're coming down that mountain, that's totally fine. That means you're growing. Um or if by the end of it, you actually go, well, I thought I was pretty bad, but now I've done this and I'm, I'm like, okay, I think I know a little bit more now. And now I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Um, and you're coming back up on the end of that. So I think it's just nice to reflect on the individually, where were you at the start and where were you at the end? Um, and how do you think that went? And then similarly, how do you feel now about conflict? So at the start, we had a lot of feelings of, there was a lot of negative feelings in that space about being confused and anxious and weary but after sort of going through that process and knowing that there's a stack of new tools and things available how do you feel now about going through conflict well, that's great to see that people are more confident they're better prepared music's um, my ears mystic about where things <laughs> are yay this is what we hoped <laughs> if you got to this point you're like I actually thought it was worse now than at the start we're being a bit worried but um it's great to hear that um that everyone's sort of coming through and they feel better off um, Sarah and I will um, send our details out to everybody if you don't already have um, our details. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us afterwards if you have any specific questions. We're going to take all the comments from the chat and try and get back to everybody. Um, and I'm also going to take all the song lists and add them to the Spotify playlist about this um, and jumping in that as well. So um, thank you so much for hanging with us um, and spending 90 minutes of going through some all, you know, sometimes personally challenging personal growth stuff around soft skills, um, but hopefully you found it useful. Um, I'd like to personally thank Sarah um, for donating her time and expertise to everybody out there today. Um, I know I've learned a lot from you over the years um, and we'll be doing a lot more things together. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Oh, look, it's mutual always, Hayley. And look, I've loved all the comments and, and uh, reflections from everyone. And I really encourage you to reach out and have these conversations. Hayley and I are up for it. We're there to support you. This work matters and what you do matters. And the more that we can equip ourselves to navigate what are challenging times, I think the better it is. So thank you, everyone, and best of luck moving forward. And those responses keep coming in. Well done, everyone. I do. <laughs> Hayley, did you want to do any questions before we um, sign off? Um, if people have questions and they want to put them in there, I know that our time is up, so I don't want to hold anybody later than they need to, but I'm quite happy to stick around for a little bit um, and answer some questions if anybody has them.